Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Prince George's County Memorial Library System's virtual events. My name is Nick. It is a great pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Library System to week 20-something of Community Conversations <laughs> with Roberta Phillips. We are so glad and honored to have the opportunity to bring information to you and access to amazing civic leaders and community leaders to you every week. Um, so I'm going to turn things over to Roberta. If you have any questions, please type them into the comment or chat box wherever you're watching us from. We're live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Feel free to share the link out. And we have a very special guest today who I know you're going to enjoy hearing from. So without further ado, Roberta Phillips. Thank you so much, Nick. So good afternoon. I'm Roberta Phillips. I'm the CEO. And I had the great honor of meeting Mr. Jeffrey, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mount Varner in the Educational Task Force for Prince George's County, where we are working on the best ways to ensure all our kids get educated in the safest way possible. Uh, a little bit about our guest today. He has more than 25 years of making split second decisions that were truly life and death. He also has degrees and or medical training from schools that include Hampton, Harvard, Wayne State, George Washington and Johns Hopkins. And I also did my graduate work at Wayne State. So we have that in common. Yeah. Um, so we are so pleased that you're here. You have had two um, phenomenal books. Training Your Mind for Split Second Decisions is your new book. And um, the subtitle is How One ER Doctor Shares His Strategy That Teaches Great Leaders to Make Excellent Decisions. And the other is Home Alive, 11 Must Rules for Surviving Encounters with Police. Um, a fun fact about Dr. Mount Varner is he is um, a coach. He has coached his middle school basketball team, his daughter's team, to three championships. All right, Doc. Um, so that's exciting. So with all that being said, uh, again, thank you for joining us. Um, you've had a really multifaceted career. So tell us a little bit about your journey from medicine to speaking to writing to civic leadership and, and how that all came about. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for having me on, on your show. Uh, thank you for what you're doing for the community as well and the committee that we serve on your comments are always insightful and wise that's Thank why you. i was honored that you asked me to appear on your show uh, i have been in prince george's county for the uh, for the last 45 years there are uh, 16 immediate family uh, members within the three mile radius of where i live and i live in in Bowie, maryland mm -hmm. and i went to bishop mcmahon for uh high school how I got to emergency medicine, uh, it was a, it, it, um, let's just say this. When I graduated from undergraduate to, to go to medical school, I wasn't sure what I wanted to like, go into. So I applied to a bunch of different sp sp specialties. Uh, do you know that about five years ago, I was going to my Who's Who book from, from, my un from undergraduate. And it said then that I was going to go to medical school and be, and be an ER doctor. I say that just to say, uh, I've always known that I was going to be an ER doctor, and I just didn't know it. It fits my, it fits my personality, and I love it. So, uh, obviously, as a uh, ER doctor, you make a lot of split split second decision. Why is it so important for this work to be shared in the U.S.? Well. <clears throat> especially during this period of time. So let me just define what a split second decision is. We make about 35,000 decisions every day. Most of them are mundane and don't even matter from, do I use a pen? Do I use a pencil? What color pants? But most of those don't even matter. Um, but about one to 2% of those are life changing and life altering. And most of those are split second decisions. So if you learn to improve your split second decisions, your, your decision IQ actually improves as well. Let's quickly define what a split second decision is. They are decisions that we make when there's a T, a time constraint, L, a lack of information, and then C, critical consequences. We call that the TLC framework. And I don't mean tender, loving care. I mean <laughs> TLC 
framework. So it's it, it's important to have a framework for how we make our split second decisions. Yeah, and I think um, as leaders, um, or even just citizens today, there are so many in in the crisis that we're going through as a nation, so many split second decisions that could be life or death, um, or that could mean um, someone having a job or someone not, someone eating or someone not. Um, so it, it's a very difficult time, I think, to be a leader. Um, and I know that, you know, there's a lot of, um, decisions being made in our country very soon. Uh, we hope those are being made thoughtfully and not split second um, because they could be life or death, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, but also, could you talk a little bit about your thoughts around split second decisions and what's happening um, with social activism right now? So I think there's some very good correlations. Wow, there, there, there are some great Correlation. I, I, I just need to back up a, a, a little further. Okay. Um, uh, you 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 mentioned both of my books, but I also have a, a bestseller, Home Alive: Eleven Must mm -hmm. Steps for Surviving Police Encounter, mm -hmm. which came out in 2017. And right. and and the whole purpose of, of that book was to teach um, young folks how to survive encounters with the Police. We didn't go down in my basement and do it. It was hundreds of hours of like interviews, about 2,000 hours worth of work went in there. And, and, and what it does is it empowers parents mm -hmm. uh, to train their their loved ones, their boys, their their like their their young people. It also empowers teachers. It gives you a framework for how to train them. And again, it's a non-policing, it's a non-police bashing book. And as my mother has always told us, it teaches you how to deal with the world as it is versus how it should be. We should always work with, we should always work towards making it how it should be, but it, it, it teaches you real life uh, uh, ways to how to survive encounters. And then on the other end of that, on this bookend, um, uh, it's split second decisions, train your mind on how to make split second decisions. That came out in 2020. And if you think about it, you've got one end that helps that helps young young people. You have the other end that basically teaches officers as well as well as executives how to make split second decisions. I'm all about saving people and saving lives, and so that's how you have that project. And it was planned. Mm -hmm. It's about the decisions that we make, and more importantly, the split second decisions that we wait and then more importantly what if our initial decisions wrong some steps that we can do to deal with when our when our decision does not give us the results that we want i said a lot did i answer your question sort of um i can let's go back a little bit to tell me some of the 11 must rules for surviving the encounters because that might help lead us more back into the the critical decisions of of leaders sure. one one of the rules is it's real simple. When you're pulled over, everyone's pulled over. When you're pulled over, meaning that you're the driver, everyone in the car is pulled over. That's important because people think that that when you're pulled over by an officer, only the, the officer is only concerned about the driver. No, the officer is concerned about everybody. So what do you do? You have rules, rules for whoever gets in in your car. For instance, you you tell them then up front if we get pulled over. Everyone needs to be quiet. I will be the only one to ask answering questions unless the officer asks me stuff. Unless that unless the officer asks you a direct question. And we and we show all hands. And number two, we don't mouth off no matter what. No matter how the officer makes you feel, no matter what they say to you, the side of the road is not the time to protest. So that's one of uh, the rules. And what you mind if I give just one more? Yeah, go ahead. One of the rules is it's called pre-de-escalate. Pre-de-escalate kind of doesn't make sense, but let me share. Um, A, just making sure that you have all the paperwork in your car, driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. And then once pulled over, uh, before the officer even gets to your car, turn the car off, turn on the inside counsel. 
If you have tenant windows, roll down all your windows. It does not matter if it's raining or not. Roll down all your windows. What you've done is you've let the officer, you've pre-de-escalated. You have put him maybe not at complete ease, but you definitely didn't raise his, uh, you, you didn't raise his concern. Mm -hmm. And so pre-de-escalating, it is absolutely key. And then once the officer approaches you, you speak respectfully, no matter how the officer speaks to you. Does, 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 does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's, it's one of those circumstances that uh, produces fear, no matter who you are being pulled over. Um, I remember getting pulled over by two cops at one time and I thought, oh my gosh, there was two of them. What had I done? You know, and it was, I mean, heart thumping, you know, the whole, um, and I did do some of those things you talked about. I rolled down my window. I got my things ready, my hand, you know, um, but it's not the same for me because of the color of my skin. So <laughs> while I was afraid, uh, just because of the adrenaline and everything that was happening, I was not afraid for my life. And so that's a huge, huge experience that I don't have any, um, you know, experience with. I have many friends who have told me their experiences of being pulled over as black men and um, frightening, uh, just frightening. Uh, and so I think this book is a way, as you said, for parents to teach. Uh, again, it's not the ideal situation. Um, and, and, it's, and as you said, not every cop or police woman or man is going to be the same. Um, we have a lot of fabulous people on our force. We know that. Um, but you don't know which one or which personality you're getting at that time. So I think, I think that's wise. Um, and, and again, you know, you want to be prepared, right? Yeah. You want to be prepared and I get it. You, uh, the younger you are, the more invincible that you think you are. And, and, and this is where training your mind to make split second decisions and home alive and home alive combined. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important. Uh, and again, let me just say this, and I keep saying it because I've done many interviews and it's always a point that people make. I'm not saying it's right. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's fair. In fact, I'm saying that it is unfair. But the facts are the facts. They are killing men, especially black males, at a disproportionate rate. And based upon my research, there's no law, there's no act of Congress that you can put in place that you're going to have an, an, an immediate stoppage of that. Mm -hmm. With that as the backdrop, Part of the goal, the main goal is to start saving lives now. So when pulled over, your ultimate goal is to make it home alive. And how do we do that? We start training. We start training our young boys and our young children right now how to behave, what to do when stopped by the police, such that it's automatic. It's automatic. The decisions you make are split seconds, but, the, but you've already been been trained on them. And one of the simple rules is your ultimate goal, no matter what, is to make it home alive. It's not it's not to be heard. It's not to protest. It's to make it home alive. And when you combine both both books, it teaches parents how to train young people and teaches officers, hey, these are some of the trainings you need to like do in preparation for you pull over a scared young man, scared young, young black man, or even a scared citizen, just like you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so um, have you done trainings for um, parents or, or, or is what's the, you know, what kind of organizations are doing this training other than of course, reading your book, are there places where, or, or workshops where parents can learn this information? Yeah, um, most I've done have, have been through private sessions. Um, okay. I used to be the de facto medical director for for the police and mm -hmm. uh, in DC back in 2014 right. when our first was 
developing this. So I've I have been trained them. I've, I've I've done some some trainings at at, at at some police event, but most of the trains are live. Although we are definitely moving towards the like virtual space. But what I've learned is that you're going to be shocked. Young people, they don't want to read the book. They don't want to do anything that are in the book. It's those people who influence the young people, which are most important. The biggest people are grandparents. They have been the most influencer, most influencing from my experiences, and then parents and pastors. Mm-hmm. But just to present the book and expect that young people are, are mm-hmm. going to want it. No, because think about it. When you were 18 and 19, weren't you invincible? Of course. <laughs> yeah. 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 Absolutely. Well, and I wonder what to what the role of, you know, celebrities or sports teams responding to some of this, if they could help influence or do you think they are influencing in a positive way what's happening? I think that they are influenced in such a positive way that they don't even recognize it. Again, nothing's going to be fixed overnight. And how do you eat an elephant? One okay. bite at a time. Mm-hmm. And, these, and, and the athletes they're part of that bite because what it says it 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 adds um all it shouldn't have to be it it adds more credibility to it Mm -hmm. after all if you have this multi-million dollar big star athlete that says hey it happened to me Mm -hmm. or it happens to me too it takes away the argument that oh it's only happened to 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 those black to those bad black men that are Mm -hmm. that are in the ghetto and actually a, a wonderful study came out of Yale University by Dr. Anderson. Don't I, I'm not sure about the name, but basically, the study highlighted that 60% of those killed by the police are killed in the suburbs or rural mm. areas. Mm. Who would have thought? Yeah, we've always thought it was the inner city, mm-hmm. but the suburbs or rural areas. And, and and what that says is part of that's training, and part of that is just a fundamental fear. As well, if COVID's not reminding us of anything, is that in this world we're all in this together. While it may not be your kid, the mm-hmm. fact that it's it's a child. Right. And that's your daughter, kid. I have counseled parents who 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 have lost children, and that's a painful counsel and a painful and it's a pain that you can feel mm-hmm. from my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, I was very, very involved in sports in middle school and high school. And I think um, I was pretty, I was a sprinter. I was really fast in my day. Um, Today's a different story. I have the knees to show for it. But (laughs) I I, I think um, that sports is another one of those really positive influencers for young people because it's, there's some accountability on being part of a team. There's an influence of um, your teammates, your coach, the working together philosophy, the discipline of training for a sport. Um, so talk a little bit about that in 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 this work. Well, this work is something about sports that, as you said, it trains your mind and it disciplines your mind. And um, I think I told you I have a 14 year old son and a 17 year old daughter, and both of them are very athletic. My daughter plays high level softball. Uh, But the studies are very clear about young ladies in sports, Mm -hmm. young ladies in sports. Recent study, uh, actually, it's not recent, came out about 10 years ago. Young ladies who are involved in sports, they are less likely to be abused when they when they when they get older. They have sex at a older age Mm -hmm. and um, they are more confident just overall. Uh, you know, obviously, when I read that <laughs> to my daughter, of course you're going to play sports, mm-hmm. and she right. did. <laughs> but the but the point is, uh, sports gives you a framework for how to interact with people, how to coordinate your time, and 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 also how to become disciplined. I think whatever sport it is, it's very important for children to play sports. Well, and that same discipline can be seen in the arts, in dance, in orchestra, being part, be, belonging to something that's a little bigger than yourself oh, I love um, is really, really critical. Um, and so 
I, I think that's really important. One of the things that the library has been doing um, is just to really raise awareness and and offer programmings that um, allow both children and adults, teens, to see the possibilities. You know, when they see someone like yourself, who's the successful ER doctor and an author, and you know, it, for for me, it's like, wow, we could be anything, right? Um, anybody can be anything, and that's such a positive message for kids. Um, and also the idea that uh, the community, Prince George's County is is really coming together to work on a lot of different issues, how we overcome COVID together, um, how we battle anti-racism together, how we uh, help each other community-wise with employment and food and security and education. And it's just been a real joy for me to see and be able to meet people like yourself who are like wanting to be part of this bigger picture. And I think I keep going back to this split second decisions and how many decisions I've had to make as a leader that were going to affect not only my staff, but all the customers yes, who visit yes. the libraries. And I'd, I'd like to, to, to know if you would share some additional strategies about that around decision making and split second decision making. Sure. And um, the, well, first of all, thank you. Uh, thank you for your comments uh, as well. Um, so part of making split second decisions are your mind is your is your mindset. And one concept that we go over in the book is no decision is a decision, meaning you failing to make a decision, you choosing not to make a decision is a decision in, in, in and of itself because right. you let the the, the environment, uh, circumstances, or maybe someone else who may not be as skilled make that decision. And, and what the book talks about is often people don't make decisions because of, of it's usually because of, of a pain. Something has happened to them in in the past, which which has caused this, which has caused some kind of self doubt. Mm -hmm. What they don't recognize is, is that wherever life gives you pain, they also gives you a gift, mm -hmm. and you got to learn to choose that gift out. If, if you don't mind for a moment, if I, if I just share you share one piece of my pain, do you mind Please for a moment? Do. While you see me on this show, you hear about the Hampton Harbor ER mm -hmm. doctor and all that kind of stuff. What you don't know about me is I grew up a congenital stutterer, could not speak a complete sentence without mm -hmm. stuttering until I was 33 years old. And as you can imagine, when I was younger, the bullies loved me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, they loved to the tease. They would pick fights. So at times you would have to fight. Didn't matter what color they were. Just the fact you were the stutterer, people always picked at you. But what it did was, oh, so as a stutterer, you've got to choose your words wisely. Because mm -hmm. every single word is a potential stutter. And you've got to learn to be succinct. And so what that did is it helped me develop my critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. And in, in case you can't tell, I am a black male. So what it also did, it hid me in plain daylight, meaning that mm -hmm. the teachers, no matter what color they were, they wanted to protect me from everybody else. So it, it, it gave me a layer of protection as well. But let's go back to that critical thinking. So uh, I, had, I had to learn to think. So, so I simply and therefore develop my critical thinking skills. Then I go on and major in math. Next thing I know, there I am at, at Wayne State, Harvard. There I am, an ER doctor. Who's the who's the most cut to his chase thinker than, than an ER doctor? What's my point? There's pain that I turn into a gift. And we all have pain that if we if we move past that pain, there's a big gift waiting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would also say coupled with that pain is is what you what you said about fear and self doubt, and I think um, you know if you have a mental model of of growth, and and a mindset of the growth mindset instead of um, you know indecision or fear, um, I, I'm always telling my staff it's okay to fail because you're learning something. You're failing forward, and and mistakes are part of everything we do. Um, and so, you know, just trying to build that culture and that that sentimentality that, you know, 
there's all kinds of opportunity. Tell me what, how you want to use your talents and passions, because I think that's what makes us so unique as humans is that we all have these different talents and passions and just figuring out a way to use them to the best of the ability to serve the community in whatever format that is, is, as you said, that's the gift, right? You are so wise. The film for it, uh, I have a section of the book that talks just about that. If failure, failure is required for success, you can ask all great leaders that. So if failure is required for success, it's really not a failure, it's a lesson. As mm -hmm. you just talked about, you just teach lessons. You are a wise, wise leader, and that's why you're the CEO. Oh, thank you. Um, I think it's part of it. It was I'm one of eight children, so I had to make a lot of split second <laughs> decisions that could have been life or death with three brothers and hockey sticks. But that's another story in itself. <laughs> right. But I really, you know, I really think um, that bringing these sorts of things to light that that. Just even the word decision, you know, like you said, we make so many decisions in a day and thinking about the ones that really matter. Mm -hmm. um, you need to take a step and you need to you need to say, what are the outcomes going to be? You know, right. like you said, blue pants or gray pants, that's not going to change anybody's life that day. But there are things that you're going to do that could change not only your life, but someone else's. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And, and then you mind if I make just one more comment about that? Absolutely. Is that people get caught up on decisions of being um, if they're right or they're wrong. They think they always have they always have to be right. Um, well, you know, unless you're God, <laughs> you're going to be wrong. And I say that to, to I say a lot of people make a wrong decision and then they wallow or they slow down and 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 and, and, it, and, it, and it disrupts everything. Part of what the book talks about is when you make a decision that does not give you the result you want, be prepared to make the next one. And believe it or not, it doesn't mean that you were wrong. Sometimes you've got all the information. You did everything perfectly. It just didn't give you the result you wanted. Be prepared to make the next one. Then sometimes, let's be honest, your decision was wrong. You're not God. Be prepared to make the next one. Lick your wounds later. When you get home at night, cry, hug, hug someone. But during the, the, the daytime, keep deciding. Keep deciding. Well, and I think, too, the way that you help other people who may be, um, or yourself, if you've made what you consider to be a wrong decision, is, again, that, that idea that we're learning. So um, there isn't a leader who doesn't make wrong decisions but we try to make the best decisions yeah so sometimes those best decisions are what's best for a, a whole and not maybe a few individuals so they say your decision's wrong but what you're realizing is that you're the decision you're making is affecting a, a greater good um, yes and so that's also something i think with leadership that uh, where split second decisions are so critical. Yes, excellent point. Excellent point. So um, I'm going to ask if there's any questions from our audience, and Nick, if you will let us know if there's any other questions. Oh, here's a question that says, "I don't trust police anymore. Do you have any suggestion?" Yes, uh, Vivian looks like your name is. Uh, hey, I, I thank you for your candor. Um, and I can only uh, 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 just assume that you've had some negative experiences. And, and let me just say that, um, that I'm sorry that, that, that you've had to endure that. Um, and, and it's going to probably take you time. But the one thing that I can share, share with you is that in my research, and I think I've interviewed hundreds of officers, read thousands of articles, um, literally thousands. And one thing I, I, I highlight to my people, I didn't come across one article or one person, one police officer who did not help someone in need, no matter what color they were. I know that doesn't make you feel better, but, but, but I left, let me wrap around this one. If you have a mother, a daughter, a, a loved one, 
The reason why it's okay, the reason why you're comfortable with them going to the mall, going to the store, is because you know if someone, if something happens to them, if someone tries to harm them, you can pick up that phone and dial 911 and someone's going to come and help them. What's my point is that I'm sorry about your pain, but the police are still there. They're still there, especially in acute situations to help us. So just it, they, these are difficult times and I'm sorry about your pain, but things are going to get better. Great. Thank you. That's a great comment. Um, more questions from our audience? Why don't you mind if I make a few comments about COVID? Please. Oh, well, um, I, I'm an ER doctor who, who I'm practicing on the on the front lines and in my uh, and in the split second world, I've talked to about a million people a week through all the different shows. And the one thing that I have to remind people of, and 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 by the way, if you don't have any religion or higher being in you, what I'm about to say is not for you. This is this is this is not going to work. But for those of you all who do, uh, the reason I can tell you that everything's going to be okay, because think back to a time when you were going through a difficult period. You weren't sure you were going to get on the other end of it. You made it through 100% of the time. Why? The fact you're listening to this broadcast right now says that you made it through each and every time. Now, for those people who don't have any God and that doesn't work, and those people who need a little bit more from me, this data is very clear. 97.9% .9 of people are going to be just fine. 97.9 and 99.8% of children are going to be just fine. Those are wonderful odds. I say that because there's this rising anxiety and fear and like stress, and that's okay. But I'm just telling you, just when you get a little down, latch on to, to the like, data, latch on to where you've been in life and you've always wound up on the other end. And, and I think too, for the people who chose to tune in today, they care and they want to, to get um, better answers and they want to have, make better decisions and, and they want to hear from somebody who, you know, has been there. I mean, obviously, um, being an ER doctor, you are seeing all kinds of things, COVID and non COVID related, that, um, that are probably a, a real scare. Yeah, and, and, and I'm glad you brought us back to that. And with the social un, unrest and with COVID, we're all kind of executives within our own household. The decisions that we make now, um, whereas a year ago they weren't life and death, now we're making life and death decisions. And again, there will often be a time constraint. You may not have, you may not have all the information you want, but look at the critical consequence of it. Um, something as simple as choosing not to wear your mask when you go into the store. There's a critical consequence to that. So I, again, this, the, how you choose to go about making your decisions, especially your split second decisions may very well save your life or the life of your family. Or most important, since we're in this together, the life of, of your neighbor or someone you don't even know. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's really important again, that, that idea that, you know, we don't have a vaccine yet, but we do have the ability to social distance, to wash our hands, to wear a mask, to not go to large social gatherings, to do the things that, you know, the CDC and our local experts are telling us are going to make a difference. And if we choose to do that together, then we're going to see that decline for sure. Yes. Um, she says, how can public servants effectively de escalate the situation? Hmm. That, oh, that, is a, that is a great question. Um, how can public uh, servants effectively de escalate situations when customers may refuse to comply with public health guidelines, like the requirements to wear a mask, social distancing, et cetera? Um, I think it's very important to like keep this in mind, and, and, and let me wrap it up this way. Medicine's changed. Um, Pre-COVID, it was all about the patient, and patients are very, very important. But about April, as you even see on the media, the world of medicine said, wait a minute, let's take care of ourselves first, meaning 
um, when when a trauma came in, you would go in there and you would gown up while you're getting ready to take care of the trauma or whatever the sick patient was. Now, you don't enter that room until you have on your PPE, until everyone is PPE down. What's my point is that when I went to medicine, no one ever explained to me I could catch something that I can bring home to my family and it kill them. The same with public servants. They're out there to serve the public. And that's what we signed up for, kind of, if you want to follow that, that, mm-hmm. that argument. But our loved ones did not. Our kids mm-hmm. did not. So even if you don't believe in wearing a mask and gloving, can you do it for us? Can you do it for the firefighter? Can you do it for the nurse? Can you do it for the people at the, at the library? Anybody who's on the front lines. It's very important for you to, to like do that so that we can protect you and protect our families at all. Do, do you will see it differently? Well, I think that, no, I, I totally agree. I think there's a couple of different things. Um, you know, we are fortunate that our county administrator and our um, legislators, our governor, has said that masks are a requirement in Maryland. So I think, you know, one of the things to do is say, I'm sorry, but this is a requirement of our state. Yes. And, you know, uh, and just calmly say that we want to stay safe. We want you to be safe. And the best way for that to happen for both of us is to wear a mask. And then, you know, there comes to a point where you, and if you're in a library situation, especially, you might have to say, I'm sorry, we can't serve you today unless you have a mask. Um, and, you know, you can't go into grocery stores without a mask. You can't, you can't go to the pharmacy without a mask. Yeah. Um, so those are all things that, you know, it's, it's becoming, as you said, a social norm now. It's not about um, uh, political or, uh, or an issue of freedom. It's about keeping everybody safe. Like you said, you might, you might take it home to somebody else who didn't sign up to be uh, a doctor or a, or librarian or, you know, somebody who works at the grocery store. So it, it's about safety for everyone. It's about safety for everyone. And even if you don't believe that COVID's real, because I, I still get those questions, everybody just keep in mind, Korea and us, we had about 90 deaths at the same time at one point. Korea ended with 390 deaths. That's where they are now. We're at 179,000 deaths. What's my point? Just put on a mask we can decrease the like, transmission. It's a split second decision mm-hmm. to put on a mask or not put on a mask. It should already be a, a decision, but choosing not to is a split second decision that you don't want to make. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, another comment again about um, death by police. Uh, and I think, you know, in all fairness, we would, have this conversation with uh, a member from the police force on as well, um, because we we don't, as we've said throughout this program, this is not about bashing police. Um, we know that this situation is dire and it's um, it's got to change. And I personally don't have the the solution. Um, I know there's a lot of smart people working at a solution. Um, because it, it it's heartbreaking and it's wrong, and we know that it's um, a crisis. It's a crisis. You're right, and it's very important to have officers on the program too. However, there's a lot of studies that show even the officers don't do one any any additional training. There's a great study that basically said if uh, for the top hundred agencies that review their use of force policies. Mm-hmm. Just review them, not necessarily change them. Mm-hmm. They experience a forty a forty percent drop in violence against citizens, a twenty five percent drop of violence against officers. Mm-hmm. And how do you get people to review the use of force policies? Voting, mm-hmm. voting in your local elections. You have the it's your local in, elections that impact your life the most. Federal elections are very important. But voting in your local elections are absolutely key. And Maryland has proven that. 
Governor Hogan, what he did with this pandemic is amazing. Um, what Angela also broke did, because keep in mind, at one point we were a hot spot. Mm -hmm. Now our positivity rate, just in Prince George's County, it's one of the lowest in the same state. I mean, it's, just, it's one of the lowest in the state. And that was all about voting, voting in our local elections. Right. Yeah, it's it's a right. It's a decision that we should all make. Um, <laughs> there you go. Roberta. Right Good back job. at you. So the next question says, does your book say anything about thinking about not what you want to do, but you would like to have done before you do it? Ooh, Donna, thank you very much. It does. There's a section of the book where it talks about visualization. Mm -hmm. It talks about visualization and it gives the it gives a wonderful example of of, of um, athletes. In fact, in this in this one study, just 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 very interesting. They had one they had one group of, of athletes where they where they ran and they and they and they and they measured muscle mass. Um, and the other group for the same period of time, they did it visually. They just did it visually. Do you know that the muscle mass measurement was about the same in the end? About I mean, they, they, it was about the same in the end with like both groups. What's the point? If physiologically our body changes just from visualizing, imagine what happens on a very cerebral level. So if you just visualize, visualizing your outcome, you're actually practicing your outcome. You're training your mind for the outcome that you expect. Mm -hmm. um, I did a vision board at one point in my career. This is what I see myself doing. This is the house I would like to live in. This is the dog I want. <laughs> and you know, a lot of those things came to fruition because Good. I visualized it. Um, and going back to the sports analogy, it's real. I was a high jumper in track as well. And we would visualize ourselves going over. We would visualize the steps we would take to get to uh, the standard and what we would do, how we would jump, what it would look like. And it's really, it is really quite powerful. Yes. Yes. And vision boards, they've shown have been some, what I recently read that your grades of leaders, most of them have a vision board and, and highly, highly, highly recommend them. Yeah. My team knows I, I love post-it notes and ideas too. So I'm always putting everything out there for everybody to, to bounce off of. So that's good. Um, any more questions? Those are some good ones. So I have a couple more. Um, sure. One of mine is, why are you Prince George's proud? Wow, that's a great question. I am Prince George's proud, proud because of the uh, of the multicultural community, uh, of the strong leadership, um, 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 and, and it's 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 it, it just has pockets of different cultures, and um, and not only that, I, I've got to admit. So my older sister is a circuit court judge in Prince George's County, and my um, younger sister is a district court judge in Prince George's mm -hmm. County. And we were we were brought up in like like Prince George County. So this is what we know. We've all went away to go to school and came back. And what we realized there's no place, there's no place like home. There's no place like Prince George County. Yeah, that's awesome. And and you know, I've been here a year and a half, and as soon as I got here, I felt like it was home. So that was very telling. Because I was now, raised you from where again? I well, I came from South Carolina, but I was born and raised uh, right outside Detroit in Michigan. Okay. All right. So, and of course, space. yes. And I, of course, um, a question here, how can first responders and service professionals take care of their mental health, given the risk and stress they're dealing with right now? Wow. That is a, that is an excellent question. That's an excellent question. And, and, and there, there, there are three things that come to mind. Um, one of them is, um, this is going to sound fluffy, but it's not meditation. Meditating either at the beginning of the day or at the end of the of the day. Two, turning off everything on your day off. Everything. No email access to you. No texting access to you. Um, no social media. You have to give a chance of mind. I mean, you have to, you have to give your mind a chance to like calm down. And then three, 
and, and, and you're not going to like this one, but you may have to decrease your overtime because you've got to give your mind and your body a chance to rest. Because imagine the rest of the world is experiencing a higher level of anxiety and stress and post-traumatic stress. You're in the front lines. So while we like to act like we're fine, all studies are showing that we experience stress just as much. We don't show it. So taking time, taking time to be gentle with yourself is key. And, and, and going back to, to split seconds, one of the part of the books, one, one part of the book it talks about when you're making decisions, especially if you're tired and you don't know what to, to like do, you really don't know what to do. Err on the side of doing what is kind and what is right. Mm. As long as you're in the realm of doing what is kind, you're most likely doing what the right thing is. That's that's lovely. And and we do offer guided meditation on demand. So um, we have that in our in our offerings. Um, I really think, you know, I, I, I'm not as good at meditation, but I do practice yoga. So that's my kind of a, a spirituality that way. Um, but I also think, you know, and I'm going to promote this because, hey, I have to reading, you know, turn the television off. It doesn't have to be a book that is um, a challenge. It can be just something that takes your mind to a different place. It's escape. It's adventure. It's somebody else's story that you can read about. Um, and so I really encourage people to, and that's my escape at night. I get out a book and, and I'm old school. I like the actual book in my hand, but whether it's your e-reader or your book, and just let your imagination do the work and, and just meld into that story. I think that's, for me, just a great escape from all the noise around me. You know, I actually need to put you on my payroll because <laughs> that's one of the points of the book within uh, about training your mind. What you read, uh, well, 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 first of all, reading is absolutely key. It, it, it helps de-stress you and it grows your mind. So, so reading is the key to, to you seeing the world differently and to you growing at, at, as a person. And it's a, it's, a, it's a clear, it's a big part of the component in training your mind as well. Recently read a study. Do you know that 65% of people, once they finish their first, I mean, their last formal education, Never read a com a complete book again. And in fact, it went on until I say, if you choose to read five books in the same area, you are considered a subject matter expert in that mm. area, er in that area, except for the true expert. So, but reading, I, I, I set aside 45 minutes an hour every day because I need an escape. I need to see the world differently. I need to like, grow. So, and what are you reading? Big pardon? What are you reading? Oh, I'm a big social science person. The Malcolm Gladwells, the Ariels. Uh, I'm a big social science per, per person because I love the studies. Which one is that? This is the new, uh, well, it's the remix. Jason Reynolds and um, Ibram X. Kendi. Yes. Anti-racism in you. And this is, Mr. Reynolds will say, um, it's not a history book, but the history in this is so fabulous. If I would have known this growing up, it would have changed me. Um, really? See? It's so good. Um, and I highly recommend it. And we're having Jason Reynolds on Tuesday, September 1st at 7 o'clock. And I get the joy of being able to interview him. Um, and this is, you know, part of the library's real um, initiative to inform and engage people on the discussion of how we end racism. And it's just, um, it's just a great read. So, it, and it's quick, it, it's very quick. Um, and of course, Dr. Uh, Kendi, we had him on as well, how to be an anti-racist and he was extraordinary. And so they came together to do a book and it's, it's just a, I think every teacher should read this. I think every kid should read this, you know, teenager. Um, and I think 
every adult who wants to learn because it's just a really, really good read. So that's my promotion of both the book and Mr. Reynolds, who will be on September 1st. That's a great endorsement. That is a great endorsement. Yeah, he he's he's on it. He has won so many Coretta Scott King Awards and um, just is a New York Times bestseller. And we are we are thrilled that he'll be joining us, just as we are thrilled that you have joined us. So um, I want to thank you again for your time, your expertise. Um, the library will be putting your books into into our collection so folks can access them. And you want to tell them about your little uh, surprise for those who are listening? Yes. So available for the next 24 hours, starting at 5 o'clock, you can go to Amazon and get the book for 99 cents. It'd be for 99 cents. If I can make it for like free, I would, but Amazon requires me to charge something. So for 99 cents, you can get a home alive, 11 must steps for surviving encounters with the police. But wait till after five, because um, I gotta go in there and change the the like setting. And for any teacher, civic organization, reach out to me at YouTube uh, forward slash Dr. Joffrey, and I will send you, uh, I, I will send copies to your um, class and you can also reach me at info at split second decisions.com info at split second decisions and i apologize i was pronouncing your name joffrey not jeffrey joffrey it, it is joffrey. No, it is joffrey. yeah joffrey i was saying is. jeffrey not oh, that's joffrey. okay people uh, that's okay people people mess that up a lot uh, i apologize for that but you have been gracious with your time and um we have I always want people to read, so we're thrilled you're offering that book, and we um, we welcome you to come back anytime you want, and uh, I'll see you on the task force. I'm gonna say I'll see you next Tuesday. Okay, sounds right, good. Thanks again. Alrighty, bye bye everyone. Have a good evening.